Yeah, it's Haramej Singh Kali Rai. And what do you actually do? I'm actually, I trained as an actor and went into directing and producing. And that was, um, a, are you part of the British South Asian community, aren't you? I was just aware of this thing. You call it British South Asian, or is it South Asian British? It's like, where do you see yourself? Like, you know, you have like black British. So why does the black have come before the British? Or is it British black? Absolutely. You know, where, where does that ideology and the politics come from? And where does one sit in there? And I see myself not sitting with any of it, really. Oh, fantastic. Hardly, especially now, you know, I think in a moment. But you are forced into a situation where you have to be slotted. And so that slottedness comes in, because I'm not sure what South Asian arts are, as in from the subcontinent or from here. You know, what the, uh, uh, so to me, what I do is, is really relate to my experience. So the work I do is whatever experience I have, I put in, because I'd never studied South Asian arts as, as, such, as such. So let's talk about your personal journey then. How did you get into this creative work? Uh, I, well, as, as an actor, uh, I, uh, I, you know, as one did when I was growing up, uh, I, mean, I came here to this country when I was young, so, and then studied, uh, just did drama at Further Education College, and then at the end of those couple of years courses that everybody did, they all went to drama schools and auditioned, so I thought, oh, we might as well do the same thing, and so I did the same thing, got accepted in a couple of drama schools, and I went to a drama school in London, just outside London. Which was? Uh, Rose Bruford. So I studied there, and then, uh, and then I went abroad and studied in Paris uh, for a couple of years there at Le Coq. And uh, yeah, and then during that, during those, between those times around when I was uh, studying at drama school, I went to Czechoslovakia and studied mime there. So mime has been very much a, very much a physical, uh, uh, a kind of physical look at theatre as opposed to coming in in a, in a kind of text based. Uh, I was, I was quite good at mime. I don't know, it's something, it was something that was already there before I went to drama school. I just happened to be good at doing things in mime and, and with my body and movement. So, um, and all the parts I always had something to do with the black shadow or, 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 or whatever spirit or something like that. But anyway, um, yeah, so that was my entry into the profession uh, through the, the, as an actor. And where were you born? In Punjab, India. And when did you come here? I was about seven when I came here. All right. And so how did your career then begin to form itself? Because, you know, there's casting considerations and how people view you. Yeah, I mean, you know, as anybody going to drama school, you, 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 you study there and you just don't see yourself as who you are. You see yourself as an actor. That, that goes across, across the board, really. And so you don't, the realization comes in as you leave drama school and you like, try to look at work and you think you're not getting work and why aren't you getting work? You know, those. But I didn't do that after drama school. I, I did one project up in the Fringe Festival and then after that I wanted to study further. I wanted to do some, I wanted to go to Lecoq and study that form of theatre. <clears throat> and so I went straight after the next term, after leaving drama school, I went straight to Paris and studied there. So it was after that. Even then I didn't want to come here, although there was a lot of jobs being advertised. I think they were doing a play called Borderline at the Royal Court. They were doing, um, uh, what was that TV thing? Uh, something, Jewel in the Crown. And they were, they, were, they were casting that. And I couldn't be bothered because I was just having a bit of fun. I was hitchhiking around Europe. And then there was, I was going down to the south of Sardinia where there was a workshop going on, you know, so I thought I'd do some clowning workshop. Uh, and then uh, from there, that was cancelled, some festival, something happened. Then hitchhiked all the way to Berlin to do a, to a workshop there. Then I went to Trondheim in, <coughs> in Norway to, um, to do some, uh, again, workshops there at the university. So I stayed there for about a month. And where were you brought up in England? Uh, Lancashire. And how did that impact on your, your creative work? Well, I mean, in a sense, I'm a northerner. So in, in sense of this country, a northerner had that kind of northern humor from a working class community. Uh, and so when I came over, it was when I was devising or working, that to me always kind of 
very much part of that thought process of where I was coming from. So working, coming back to London and eventually getting there, it's then when I started looking and then all this idea of being Asian came about. I didn't know what Asian was before that sense. I never used the term. It only became usable as I came in and the first person who was kind of using it was Jatinda, Jatinda Verma. And he kind of, I think he was the one explaining to me what it meant and I just thought there was a bit of a laugh really, all this thing about being cold Asian. It was and that's where you were. And there was a festival of India, festival, alternative India uh, festival going on as well. And that's when I discovered that actually the work I was coming with, you know, my ideas were very uh, based on Lecoq style of forming companies and working in a very physical kind of way uh, uh, and doing, using movement, mime, theatre. But when I went to try and form and work with people, people didn't really have an understanding of what I was talking about. So how did you manage then? Well, that's what happened was that there were companies like Stephen Burkhoff, his company were doing that kind of work and I understood that and that's the work I wanted to get into and Moving Picture Mime Show was another idea. Um, uh, then shared experience with that kind of work, storytelling through physical forms, all those kind of three companies that influenced me a lot. Uh, is the area I wanted to be, but nothing was around. And then I met a few people who were forming a company called the Asian Cooperative Theatre. And so that was with Frug Dundee and uh, Deepak Basu and, and a few others. And they said, look, come with us. Let's, we're talking about forming a company. So we met and keep, kept meeting. And finally, we formed, we formed a company called Asian Cooperative Theatre, and that's the name we stuck. And then we had quite a broad group of people. We invited a few people to join us. Uh, and at that time, there was quite a, a broad uh, a group of people, whether uh, producers, administrators, actors, writers. We didn't have any directors at the time. And so I was one of the actors. And, uh, and then we worked. That was a company, basically, that was part of. Eventually, after a few years, I started running the company. Uh, and we started doing workshops in there and what have you. So I became kind of a producer, coordinator producer in the company. Uh, but I think I started from there because of work. Uh, the, you are forced in the situation to look at who you are, which is the colour you are, because it's based on colour, it's not nothing else about culture or whatever links. So you went getting the work uh, as an actor. Um, and the work you get is what I call them as Patel, Singh and Ali jobs. You know, so those are the parts that you get. You get Mr Patel, Mr Singh, Mr Ali. And, uh, and, and that's you loosely based on film TV work. Uh, theatre work, if it's to do with the British Raj at that time, you got a job. Anything else, you worked in theatre and education, uh, which, which was the only area that didn't matter what colour you were, black, white, uh, brown, Asian, whatever, doesn't matter. So you were employed and you, were, you could actually play any part, you could devise shows, and it's about politics. So I was in moving parts theatre company where we devised shows about politics at that time women issue, Thatcher was really uh, quite big at that time, so it's uh, or period after that. So it's politics. Um, and because of that, what happened is, uh, because of the way I worked at Lecoq and the way I worked everywhere else, so I started formulating a kind of way of working as a director uh, and workshop. So the directing aspect started entering my, my kind of life. And again, to do with not getting enough work as an actor, and I can't I'm not the person who'll just sit around and wait for jobs to come by or, you know, so I had to be proactive in, in another way. So that's when producing and directing came about. And the last thing we did at the Asian Cooperative Theatre when I was involved was I wanted to do Lorca, Lorca's uh, Blood Wedding. And I wanted to do it because I wanted to look at the, the whole history of Katak and how it evolved into kind of from, and the gypsies the kind of involvement from leaving Rajasthan at that time, going into Spain. There was, sort of, there was a southern area was going down towards the sort of Middle East and towards Spain, and the other area was through Russia and all the Eastern Bloc, uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria and that kind of, so there's two brands of gypsy kind of movements. And so I wanted to set blood wedding between India and Spain. So between there we had, so we had a quite assortment of actors, Caribbean, African, Chinese, Indian actors. And uh, so I was there as a producer. So you still have a bit of an Asian theme in some of your work. Yeah. Um, how important was that to you or not at all? 
Well, I suppose it's, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of, uh, within your work, what you're also doing is, in some sense, you're kind of learning about who you are, where you're from, as part of the work, as, as all artists do. And so you don't question it originally. You don't think, well, I'm going to do something about my life or where I'm from. You just are kind of forced into that situation. And then what you start looking is, okay, if I'd want to do something like Lorca, because it's a very passionate play, and I just love the play, but then if it's a Spanish place, how is it relevant to me? What's it? Because it's, you know, you have universal themes in there. So how is it universal to me? And how is it important to me where I come from? So that's when you start investigating it. So you have a sort of different way of working with South Asian themes than some of the other South Asian theatre practitioners that have uh, created some really quite clear um, of categories of South Asian work um, and you kind of have a slightly different way of looking at it yeah yeah which is much more multicultural and much more global yeah yeah I don't I don't I, I see it as in kind of using my experience into a project so I don't see it as a South Asian theme or whatever things I mean I look at it and think what can I put into it as in my experience of physicalizing it uh, physicalizing the text and looking at it different colors and what whatever that's that's the concept I come into so as a producer how did you find the funding mindset uh, yeah I mean it, it's changed a lot over the years you know you it was very much categorized so there's in the a because that time it was the Asian area not South Asian and now you've got East Asian and South Asian you know you know all that stuff but and then you had, you kind of under, I suppose it was the umbrella, first umbrella was the black theatre. And in the black theatre season that we had, you had black uh, uh, African Caribbean companies, you had uh, South Asian companies performing within that, in that area. So the pocket that you would uh, apply for would be under that umbrella, you know, under the, uh, and then it became the South Asian as well, and sort of. Um, and you couldn't do, you had to relate the work you did, because otherwise you wouldn't get the money, because... Uh, you don't get the money. You can't be um, uh, the Smith Theatre Company. You have to be the Patel Singh and Ali Theatre Company, and they get your work. So my colour, calling itself John Smith Theatre Company, I wouldn't get the money. I wouldn't get it. But having called it Patel Singh and Ali Theatre Company, I would get the money. But do you think you might get the money now if you called yourself the John Smith Company? But, well, I wouldn't call it John Smith. I'll call it something else, like what we have is zero culture, <laughs> you know. So to, to the whole point of zero culture says quite a lot from our background where we come from. So that's the kind of setting. You put it in such a way where actually, what do I concern myself with? It isn't with Britain. It isn't with India. It's how I am and reflected to my experiences around the world. I mean, my, my world is Europe, India subcontinent, and Britain. Those are the three areas. I, I haven't lived in the States or Canada, although I've been there. But, or Australia. So, so that's the connection. So my world is in those kind of areas. And, and sometimes you can get challenged by, by, by your own perspective, by your own background and your own beliefs by other projects that come in. I mean, we did a, pro a production of uh, the Maharaja and the Koino, which is uh, written by Hardeel Rai, and, uh, which was a film script originally. And then what we did is made a theatre and education program, which we actually took to LA in America. And then there's a lot of Sikh community there. And it was the last Maharaja of the Punjab, and it talked about the, the relationship between the Maharaja and Queen Victoria. So having taken it to LA, although it doesn't have that British uh, Raj kind of experience, it was interesting taking it there because it was the, it's the immigrants that evolved maybe from sort of India or East Africa, UK, and then America. So it was just a different journey to it, and that was kind of interesting looking at that. So in a sense, your journey also has come from where your parents have come from, where your ancestors have come from, and how they uh, came to adopt perhaps the values and environments of this country, and then you grew up with that mix. Well, I, I come from a business background. I mean, you know, my father was working in a, in a cotton industry factory. My mom was working in a biscuit factory, so that's the area that I grew up in, you know. Uh, knowing that there was parties going on every Christmas in this uh, uh, cotton industry. They had a massive, and it was a very English party to me, coming from India, was like, whoa, this is great. 
and then my mother would come in at the end of the week with some biscuits, large biscuits, and go, wow, this is great. And nothing, any relevance to back home in India. So we, we just had a great time as, as young people, you know, growing up in this country. But, but my father, what he did was develop business. He was like a sing of all trades. I mean, he, you know, you have to look after your family. So he was doing carpentry, plumbing, decorating, DIY, going around to people's houses, fixing them up, getting paid for that. And then, because he was, I think, I think that immigrant community at that time would come in and they need, to, they were very good survivors. They knew how to survive. Whatever business they were, they knew how they would, how, how to sort of implement it. He went into selling shirts and ties in, in, in markets. From there, he developed his own rag business, rag trade business. And that's how I was brought up, in the rag trade, really. But um, you never went into that? No, I ran away from it. My father wanted me to take over his business. So the, my way was to get, the only way to get away from it was to run away and then involve myself in drama. That's yeah. why I started drama, was to run away from my father. And what did he make of it? I mean, to this day, I mean, what does he oh, think? Oh, he hated, he hated it. He hated it. He he tried to find me everywhere I was, uh, to try and bring me back into the business. Um, until I, until I eventually thought I've got to leave the country, and I went to Paris, uh, France, to study there. So that was quite traumatic, really. Yeah, yeah, it was. But that actually formed you. It it sort of created your character, your cultural character, or your creative character. I, I kind of, you kind of look at why, why am I doing the arts, why am I in theatre, because it's not, you know, I know a lot of white actors were in there, they really wanted to become an actor, and that's what they did, and I never had that. And I thought, well, I never really wanted to become an actor, I only did it because everybody else was doing it. And I thought, that's what you do, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, I was studying engineering drawing um, in A-level, and, the, the, you know, looking at wind forces on, on bridges and stuff like that. And, um, uh, so, uh, so partly I, I kind of wanted, I had a movie camera, a Super 8 camera, and I wanted to direct film. So there was a wanting of that earlier, but I didn't know how to implement it, so I just left it. So I so, so guess somehow there was a drama element to it. I think there was something about the freedom of movement led me to kind of, there's, there's a philosophy that Rose Bruford in drama school have, and that is the freedom of movement leads to the freedom of the voice. So, and, and what I was good at was movement physicalizing the things and suddenly doing, just grabbing things. And I just knew what to do with my hands and how to create things and how to open doors and just sort of knew. And I developed that further. And then when going, studying in Le, at, at the Jacques Lecoq was very physical school. And I was very happy there because it was like, I felt, oh, at last, I know this, I can do this. And that, I think, if anything, kind of uh, molded me into doing theatre. I think that's when I realised I, I quite like this. I wanted to develop more of this. But so, I never had the opportunity to develop it though. That's the problem. Well, there's always an opportunity now. Well, yeah, I mean, partly. Uh, it's, it's different because part of me was I wanted to, be, to develop my, the, 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 as an actor, the kind of work I did, so be challenged by it. But you weren't being given the challenging parts. Um, so, you kind of start exploring the, the directing side of it. I'm still, I mean, it's still, it's still an exploration. So if your father hated what you were doing, how did you finance your training? How did you manage to go from place to place? Uh, I told him I was training to be a teacher. Uh, that's when I was in London. And so I happened to get two thirds of my fees paid for. The rest he helped me, or, or, or I got a grant for that, actually. And uh, later, when I went to Paris, I said, this is a specialist course in teaching. And then uh, the Rose Bruford helped me in that, because I applied for a, a, a scholarship or something that they gave me an award to help me to go and study in, which is what, that's the two-third, actually, that helped me pay for the fees in, uh, at, uh, in Paris at Lecoq. And then I worked there. I worked in hotels, babysitting and things like that. And I stayed in a flat with two other people I shared and dosed around and that's how I paid for myself. So it's quite good actually because they kind of supported you, didn't they? Um, you know, through the grants and through the scholarships, the support, you did get the support. Um, well, nowadays you can't really, it's so difficult. No, no, nowadays, no, you, you have to 
get a massive overdraft from a bank and have to spend the rest of your life paying for it. That's what's happened now. We were lucky then. We're not lucky. That's what it should be now. I mean, you should, you know, you should have the right to be able to, you know, every, every child should be educated, you know, as far as you can take them. So do you ever think about your audiences when you create your own work? Yeah, you know, I mean, the audience is important. I mean, some of the work we do is catered for a particular kind of audience, like young people. So it's kind of re-looking some of the history, like when I mentioned the Maharaja and the Koinur. It's looking at the history of the world's biggest diamond, the Dan, and the history of the Raj, the Queen Victoria, and what happened in Punjab, and how the Sikh and British wars that were going on. You know, like they're just re-looking at the kind of history. So we would take it to schools, we'd do an hour show, an hour workshop. Um, so it mattered. And so, yeah, every show you do, the, the, the audience is very important. And did you keep the kind of physical aspect in your direction? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes um, I would. It all kind of depended on the time of rehearsal you got. Sometimes you only had, it's different. I mean, we were thrown in a situation, we didn't have enough money. We would have one or two weeks rehearsals on a new play and you just had to get on and do it. You didn't have time to ex explore it. So whatever came out, some of that physicalization came out, some didn't, you just get in to do the play just to make sure you get it ready. You don't have the luxury of four or five week rehearsals and you've got a rehearsal room, you've got a theater already booked, and we didn't have, you know, you're a company where you had to do all the bookings, you had to find the venues, rehearsal venues, the money to pay people, the transport, and you know, you're setting everything up yourself, doing all that, so you went there on an artistic vision alone. You had to think outside that as well. So there's a lot going on. You had not had the luxury of a director who's just there creatively directing sometimes. So how has that helped your work evolve over time then? That's where the producing directing came on, you know. So now as a director you're going in, you have an understanding of how the whole thing works. As an actor I wanted to know what happened to the lights and the costume, what was happening. I'd, it's me there as an actor, but I wanted to know what was going on around me so that they're helping me tell the story as in within the production, then I'm inside there telling the same, you know, so I, I always wanted that kind of quality. So in a sense that kind of fitted really well into directing and producing because it's that knowledge you need to have an overall uh, uh, understanding of how you kind of see the world in some sense. And, and uh, so that helped in, in, in to see the tour, where the problems were. You already see problems coming up, so you're trying to iron them out as early as possible. So how do you see the whole kind of South Asian theatre scene now and where you might be positioned within it? Um, and how is it spilling out and how is it evolving into other areas? How is it being embraced by all of British society? I sometimes find it it's difficult nowadays um, out there because there are a lot of new people coming in who come in from the perspective of um, of their coming in that they're creating this whatever this South Asian work is that they're creating it for the first time and they're there eyeing things out but they've got the luxury of social networking a lot of luxury of other things that are already implemented. It's easier to get a, a, a camera and start taking photographs and get a website and just shoot it up in the website and, and then feeding information daily of what's happening. We didn't have any like kind of luxury, but the fact that there is a whole history to this kind of work, whatever that work is, it's a whole history that's there, <clears throat> you know, in, in a kind of a where, to, where it's been implemented for you, for anybody out there. But sometimes there's a, superficial, a, a superficiality about it all. So people come in thinking they can just get in there and do a piece of work very quickly. And when you look at it, I've seen some of this work, and it's, I have to say it's crap. It's just a lot of bullshit. And when you look at it, you're thinking, what the hell is this rubbish? You know, and there's just no solid kind of background, there's no building or the concept of understanding what theatre is, what rehearsals are, what acting is all about, what experience is all about, what you do and how you spend four weeks on a text, on a piece of line, on a word, 
to have that meaning, to what it's about, to exploring dynamics between characters, you know, to spend time, uh, meaningful time, to go underneath the text, underneath the play, then bring it together with the lights and the costume, blah, 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 and then have that piece presented to the audience. Uh, as opposed to spending a few days at it, I'm, I'm being, okay, you know, but, and then just present. I, there's a, I've seen work out there which I just think is just, when I say it's, it's going back, 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 and back. I mean, even then, back there, they, they had some good production. I think sometimes it's a lot of... It's interesting that you're actually referring to a proscenium stage, a proscenium arch stage type production. What about um, other genres nowadays? Because we've really kind of merged a lot of the, the categories, haven't we? different ways of performing, different styles. How do you feel about that? Because it seems to me that your original work and original intention was to burst free of all that. Um, no, that is just a square. I mean, it's, that's not what I'm saying. But actually, my work doesn't... I, uh, it depends on the venue you get, you know. I mean, I'm all into breaking that, really. Uh, <clears throat> I, I prefer to have a style, create it, and then break it and start creating something else. That's a challenge in it. And that's one of the things, that's my background, which, which implements itself into breaking styles and creating new styles. Um, so I'd like to use dance. I mean, uh, when I worked at the MAC, Middle Arts Centre, there, they had the Arena Theatre. So, and it's got a semi-round theatre. And then we built a stage between the bar and the cafe area, which is outdoor, where we had a dance event. So it's a kind of site-specific, but also uh, promenade show, so the audience would follow the action all the way down to where the lake is and then into the arena theatre itself where the, where the action would happen in front of you, would happen behind you. When there was a battle scene, we had people all over the place battling. So it's kind of using the, 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 the whatever you have there to tell your story through storytelling, through dance, through music, through the spectacular as an epic form. That's what I'm really into, what I love doing. Uh, big spectacle theatre, but also it has to have the narrative in it, it has to have a story, it has to have a professional way of working. So even those people, I mean, we had people about 70, 80 people in the cast, so you had young people, people from the community, you had dancers, you had musicians in there. But each, you have to push them all up to a standard where they're all in the same standard, you know. So you had professional actors in there as well. So but everybody had to work very, very hard to get it up to a certain standard to tell that story, to, to link it all together. Yeah, that's, so that's a specific example of, uh, of one of the, the productions you've done. Um, can you think of any others that, um, perhaps for the viewer who might not know your work, perhaps you could describe some key productions in your, your life that perhaps has really, you know, which really <coughs> you're proud of and really think that that, that there was um, you know a stepping stone i don't know i don't think i have any production that is a stepping stone you know um i, I don't know it's but in your, your you say it's exploratory what you're doing is exploratory you're finding out things so by your productions you must be you know things must be coming um, suddenly apparent to you and you think my god you know as a revelation here. But exploration happens two ways. One, it's, it's, it's uh, an organisation you work for, you don't think about the money because it's already funded and you employ the actors and people like that. You have maybe two months rehearsals and you do that. You know, you can find different ways of exploring. Or totally the other way, you have no money whatsoever. But you've got a committed group of actors, committed group of people. And, and what you do is you come together to create work. So there's the only two ways you can explore our ways of doing of of really kind of uh, uh, going to areas where you haven't gone, You're ch everybody's challenged. You know, there's a company called Futsbon, Futsbon Theatre Company. They're a, a company who I saw when I was studying and saw them afterwards as well. And I thought they're they're excellent company in, in that kind of way of thinking, of, of working as an ensemble group of people who would just leave the distractions of a city distractions of life in other words, but they're all committed to doing, I don't want to say theatre, as some kind of creative work they do together. So they have singers in there, dancers in there, actors in there, administrators, producers, writers, directors, teachers, 
And uh, they would live, they'd have to go, they went somewhere around Devon or Cornwell, that's where they were. They had a farm there and they worked and lived there and produced work. You know, even the classics like King Lear, fantastic productions. But they had kids there, they had teachers there, and they went on a world tour, you know. And that is the old style of kind of circus, you know, the circus that comes to town, and the whole family comes together. That was like a family of people. Uh, Ariel Mnuchkin in Paris, her theatre, Again, she spends months and months uh, rehearsing on a show with a group of maybe 20, 30 actors, you know, who, when I was with them and I knew a few actors who were there, and everybody would cook together, everybody would eat together. Nobody knew what part they were playing. They were playing different parts and trying. I would be Richard II, somebody else would be Richard, somebody else, da 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 da, da. it would change, change, until finally she would cast it. You know, it's that ensemble way what I would love to work as an actor or as a director, you know. But I've never done that here in this country. As a, I've done little bits of it. Like with the young Vic, we did um, a production of uh, Arabian Nights. And that was an ensemble of about nine actors. We worked together, did really well. And then after a few months, they decided to do a, a UK tour of it. And uh, we got back together, did a six months tour together. And, uh, and that was really cool, that was really physical, and people storytelling, da 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 da. Yeah, and, but you say you've never done <coughs> this, like, Ariane Mnuchin's work, type of work here. Why do you think that is? Is it the funding constraints? Uh, it, it's different, it's, it's, it's partly funding, it's partly also finding the right, sort of like-minded people who think, although I, I ha, I'm not saying I was the person to do that, but I had some, maybe some bits of that thinking that I wanted to explore. I couldn't find anybody else to do the similar things who would, who would think that way. Um, the, the, the thinking here was, you are an actor, you get a job, you do three weeks rehearsal, four weeks rehearsal, you do the show, you do a tour, and that's it, that's everybody, they just thought in those kind of levels. There was no other kind of thinking that was going on. The only way you would move, I mean, the, football, it was around the 60s, they had that 60s mentality, you know, of, of, of work at that time. So, and, and there weren't many companies, you know, they had a rep system here. The system here had already existed. You fit in and you get a job, or you don't fit in, and you have to create your own system. There was nothing there, you know. And people did it in threes, fours, very small. You know, like, uh, uh, as I said earlier on, moving picture Manshaw, which is three, uh, three performers who studied at Lecoq, did that Lecoqian style. And then later on, Complicity, who were there a year below me, but they formed there, a few of them formed the country. They did really well. But, you know, you have to find the like mind. but they all worked with Lecoqian actors who had that thinking. Understanding of when someone gets on a, on a, on a, on a stage to, to improvise, they had an understanding of how, where they're going to go and what you're going to do and how you um, work as an ensemble member. You know, you have to work with like-minded people. So with Zero Culture, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve now? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, the way is Zero Culture, we're, we're kind of what the way we do, we loosely, we, we're a collection of producers, directors, writers. Who, Although that, there aren't that many people, that's the way we work with other people. So we work with other producers, other writers, or other, other theatre buildings, as in co-productions and what have you. We don't want to keep creating the kind of uh, the circle, as it were. We don't want to keep creating the way of working. Those way of working exist. So what we do, we have an idea, and we take on and work with other producers who might want to work with us. We don't have a building, or we just have a, you know, we don't have a a continuation, we just pro applied per project. And so I, I do that, but I also work as a freelance, freelance actor, freelance director. So I don't like to tune myself in one particular company. I'm not Tara, I'm not Tomasa, I'm not Carly. I'm not Zero Culture, but I'm not, I think, but Zero Culture doesn't come like that. We don't create it as an a Asian theatre company that has a background of Asian work or whatever, even though we have. We don't, it's not an Asian theatre company. It's just a company that does music, does dance, theatre, film. Those are the areas we're involved in. So we don't particularly say we're a South Asian uh, company that works with the South Asian area. We don't. So it's breaking all that, really. So is there anything in particular that you'd like us to know about? 
about your work, about where you, your vision, where you aim to go, what else is there, what's the future, how do you see the landscape of, you know, the cultural landscape in this country, all these questions, anything that comes to mind? I think, I think one thing to take in mind is that without a past, we don't have a future. So if you ignore the past, you can't go anywhere. A lot of mistakes are made when you know what's already been created, already been experienced that already had been had. And I think it's, it's, it's about looking what's been in order to be where you are now and where you want to go. And that's so vitally important and we miss that sometimes. We just get to a position where we are. I have all this to offer the world and I'm going to do it. I'm going to go forward and do that. That's good. But also you have all that history behind you that got you to that place. And that's that sharing you do with new people that are coming in. And it's just about sharing. It's not saying I know more than you. I know something that I can pass over to you and you have something fresh, which I don't have. I want that. So it's a, it's a two-way exchange that we have a meeting ground. And that's when creativity happens. It doesn't happen like that or like that from where I come. It happens when it's like that. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. That's great.